you're standing, if you'd remain standing, we're going to go to the book of Ezra. I want to go to the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter number 9, and then also we're going to go to Nehemiah chapter number 8. Uh, one little freebie, I threw this out there in the last service, I, just some cool stuff and in study and studying about Ezra, and we have been talking about revival. One unique thing, if you look at, uh, if you got your Bible there or you're on your phone, Second Chronicles, the book that precedes Ezra is a historical book, Second Chronicles. The very last chapter and the very last two verses, Ezra, or, uh, Second Chronicles 36, 22, and 23, notice what it says. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, see that? Go to Ezra 1 and 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. The end of Chronicles, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah, the beginning of the book of Ezra, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. It's the exact same verses. Chronicles, the last two verses of Chronicles end with what begins the first two verses of Ezra. That's pretty cool. In other words, there's a continuity, and Ezra played a vital role that we're going to talk about today. And uh, he was a great man of the word of God. So we are on a subject of revival. We're going to talk about revival. I'll give you time to catch up. I'm okay with that. We're going to talk about revival, and we're going to talk about what the Bible has to say. And there's a whole bunch of revivals in the Bible. We could literally spend probably a year going through this. But I want to specifically bring you to Ezra chapter 9 and verse number 8. And now listen to what he says. For a little space... Years ago, he said, grace hath been showed. Years ago, I preached a message called the space of grace, the little space of grace. And Ezra realizes that he's in a, a moment of mercy, a time that God carved out in the middle of what had been generations of chaos. And Ezra says, God's given us a little space of grace. It's been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us the remnant to escape, they're coming out of Babylon, to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little... Where's my scriptures? Help me out here, people. There we go. He might give us a little reviving in our bondage. That is Ezra's prayer. Give us, God, just give us a revival. We're coming out of all this mess. Give us a revival. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. Ezra and Nehemiah, they say, are companion books. That In the Hebrew Bible, the, the two of those books are together, Ezra and Nehemiah. So he's talking about the building of that wall. Now, so going to Nehemiah chapter 8. Verse 1, all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. They spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the, bring the book, they said. Bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate. From the morning until midday. You think I preach long sometimes. Before the men and women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood. We're going to talk about this a little bit. He stood on the pulpit. Which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood a long list of people. And Ezra... Verse 5, open the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Do you see the tradition right there? We have the introduction of a pulpit. We have the introduction of when the word of God is being read, everybody stood up. So you're doing a good thing today in standing. It's a good tradition in standing. You know what you're saying? We honor the word of God. It's a good thing. And if you can't stand, that's, you're not being rebellious. I, I, it's okay. But these people, they stood up. And they stood up to honor the word of God. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. Pentecostals, you're in good company with Ezra and his group of holy worshipers. They heard the word, they worshiped, they lifted their hands. They bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their face to the ground. Also, he gives another long list of people, along with the Levites, caused the people to understand the law 
and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So we're going to talk this morning about Ezra's revival and what was at the core of Ezra's revival and why they had a revival during Ezra's time. We talked about Josiah last week and his heart, his tender heart toward God. And this week we're going to talk about Ezra's revival. Jesus, hallelujah, we're gathered together, Lord, on a 4th of July weekend. We thank you for freedom and liberty. Thank you, Lord, for the power of your spirit and greater. Lord, along with that, the power of the word of God. I pray in Jesus' name, open hearts, minds, lives. I pray your anointing, Lord, can do nothing without you. Communicate your great truth to your people and help us to have a revival in our hearts, in our families, in our church, in our city, community, our state, our nation, and in our world. We pray in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. you may be seated. Mighty Babylon, which was the premier nation on planet Earth, a mighty, mighty superpower, led by horrifying King Nebuchadnezzar, had invaded Israel and had literally leveled it to the ground. The people of God, their temple, their priesthood, their walls, their city had been decimated, eradicated burned. They're carried into captivity. Basically an entire generation had been extricated from their very own land, extricated from the worship of their one true and living God, and were serving in bondage to a foreign corrupt nation known as Babylon. Every time we read about Babylon in the Bible, we, we need to have a fresh understanding, if, and if you don't know this, an understanding that Babylon was a type of worldliness and ungodliness and false worship. It was a, in many ways, a terrible place. And even when we go into our New Testament all the way to the last book of the Bible, it's used as a metaphor when it speaks of Babylon, mystery Babylon. It was a, a, a wicked place. It was a cauldron of devils in many ways. And yet in spite of all of this, the people of God had been ravaged, taken from their land, planted in a foreign country, in a foreign community. And yet in spite of all of this, thank you, Mitchells, for singing about God's mercy. Thank God for his mercy, though judgment comes. Judgment in many ways is an act of mercy in itself because God could just kill us and send us straight to hell, but he doesn't do that. Sometimes he'll bring conviction, he'll bring prophetic words, sometimes he'll bring judgment. And even in this judgment, the people of God that have been taken out of their own their own home country and their, their place of worship and their temple and their priesthood and their holy of holies and their Shekinah glory of God and all that had been taken from them and they had been taken from their own land. And yet, in spite of all of that, God still had a plan for his people. Now, I don't intend to preach along these lines, but I would maybe as we walk along this way remind someone that our God is a God of restoration. We need to thank God for that. Even those that are far away from the Lord, I'm so thankful that his mercies and his compassions fail not, and he's still a good God. That though we are far from him in his mercy, he still, in his own grace, and as a result of his own character, chooses to bring restoration and reformation to our lives. This is what he was in the process of doing, and oftentimes when we read through the Bible, it's unfortunate for us, because it's difficult sometimes. This Bible is a big book. It's often challenging to put it all together. And you read a book of the Bible and we read things separately and oftentimes don't maybe have a full understanding how all the books of the Bible harmonize and particularly how certain locales and time frames work together. And so when you read your Bible, there are going to be different books you read in your Bible and you're like, you will separate it from other books of the Bible. When this Bible is, is a bunch of books that come together and harmonize into one book. And what I'm saying is there are many, many uh, Old Testament prophets per se, major prophets, minor prophets, books of the Old Testament that we read them separately. And yet, if we don't have the understanding, we don't recognize that they fit together in their preaching and teaching 
to the same group of people during the same time period. Which basically, when, when we're dealing with this particular time period, when God is trying to restore and resurrect his people and reestablish them in their, their homeland, he is, he is bringing together all kinds of people so that there could be a revival. There could be a restoration. So Israel had been dismantled, walls torn down, the glorious temple stripped of its beauty, carried the friends and family away in chains, and Haggai, who we read about in the Old Testament as a prophet, the young teenager, becomes a captor for the majority of his life. Later, Cyrus, king of Persia, conquers Babylon, so the Jewish people and their homeland become his possession. He was compassionate to God's people and allowed a man by the name of Zerubbabel, a contingency of his leaders, and about 50,000 Jews to return to their homeland. When they return to their homeland, it begins a quick work of rebuilding the temple. By now, 50 years had transpired since the original destruction of the temple. And God was very interested in people being reestablished in the word and in worship and in the spirit. Though they had been in Babylon for many years, the process of rebuilding the temple was in process. The work of restoration was locally met, unfortunately, as it always is, with great resistance. And so, every time there is going to be a move of God, there's going to be a corresponding resistance that comes from the enemy of all of the purposes of God. Somebody said amen. So this begins, they begin to rebuild the temple, they begin to reoccupy their homeland, and resistance comes. The work of restoration that was met with resistance, the Samaritans who were living in Palestine during the time, accused the Jews of rebellion. They had sadly only just begun the work of rebuilding the temple of God. The joyous work was halted, and all that was there was the foundation of the temple that had been laid. For 16 years, there was no further construction. Mocking them disparagingly was nothing more than a foundation of stone staring blankly into the sky. No timbers, no holy of holies, no altar, no holy place, no Shekinah glory of God, no church. 66 long years had gone by. And unfortunately, people had grown satisfied with this sense of incompleteness. Fortunately, another king rose up who gave them favor. King Darius the Great adopted a series of policies aimed at encouraging religious activity. They now had the green light that they could move the work of God forward to the next stage. They'd gone from halting to now moving the work of God forward. They had the blessed approval for kingdom expansion. And probably many of them within their hearts said, yes, we can build. Yes, yes, we can move forward. We have permission to do so. And what happened? Exactly nothing. What often happens? Nothing. Apathy. Discouragement. Carnal satisfaction. It should have been a quick response, but it brought nothing. And yet in the middle of all of this, God began to stir up a revival. Somebody say revival. 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 And history reveals to us what the canon of Scripture does not immediately show at a glance. And if you don't read between the lines and you don't put the proper books together, you won't see what is a very miracle time frame of God resurrecting a work a convergence of contemporary prophets rise up. Not just one, but many of them. A confluence of visionary leaders come together. People with gifts of carpentry. People with gifts of administration. They begin to come together. The priests come together. The prophets come together. And if you really look at it from a timeline and look at it, it's, it's like there's a log jam in a literary way, a prophetic highway. Why? Because during this particular point in time in Ezra's life, God is interested in restoring the worship of God among the people of God. God's interested in that. God's interested in revival far greater than any of us could ever be interested in revival. 
God wants there to be a resurrection of his will and his word greater than any person could ever want that. And when he begins to do that, we find in the scripture there is a convergence that takes place. What I will refer to this morning as a titan, the titans of teamwork. We have Zechariah the prophet shows up and he is preaching. We have Haggai the prophet, he's preaching during this exact time period. We have Zerubbabel, who is a man that has a leadership gifting, and he's a builder, and he brings people together, and they start laying the foundation of the house of God. We have Malachi, that most of us look at Malachi, and we say, well, that's the last book of the Old Testament. But, but it was situated in a place where Malachi was preaching during the rebuilding of the, the temple and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And Malachi is preaching to maladies that the people of God are facing, and he's preaching about bad relationships among husband and wives, and he's bringing the people back to the importance of, of tithing. Because tithing matters. And if you don't have tithing, you don't have a church. Well, you don't. And he's, he's preaching along. And then Nehemiah comes along, and Nehemiah's a wall builder. And he's like, we can have great worship, and we can have great church. But if we got no defensive fortifications, we can worship God, but the enemy at will can just run into our nation and destroy us. And so God puts in the heart of a Nehemiah saying, we've got to build some walls so that we can be protected. And all of these, these preachers and prophets and visionaries and builders are all coming together. Oh, hallelujah, I feel the Holy Ghost. Because God was saying, there's something special that's taking place. Uh, and I want to kiss my land and I want my temple to be glorified all over again. And I want my people to come together. And I want the worship of God to come together. And God said, I want there to be a revival. And I want there to be a revival so bad that I'm going to raise a bunch of people up to do it. It's not just going to be one person here and one person there. But God said, I'm going to be, bring a confluence of visionaries and prophets and men of God and women of God and wall builders and, and architects and people with guilt, giftings. Why? Because God said, I want there to be a revival. If there's going to be a revival, people are going to have to come together and link their arms and their hearts and their lives and their passions and their sweat equity and their, their everything. Everything God said, God said, I'm going to bring them all together and I'm going to bring them all together. They're going to be preaching and prophesying and building and working together and we're going to work together. And God said, because I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to author a revival in my land. And in the middle of all of these was a guy by the name of Ezra. Ezra is the man I want to introduce you to today, bringing a restoration to the people of God. And all these people are sent of God to this land. Why? Because there had to be a revival. Jerusalem had been destroyed. There was no temple. There was no foundation, no walls. But God said, I'm going to raise up a group because it's time for revival. It's time for revival. So he raises up this man. I want to introduce you to him. I don't know how much you've read about him or... Or maybe he looked into his life, but he is a great man of God. He's a great man of God. One of the interesting characteristics of Ezra was Ezra was not born, reared, and raised in Jerusalem nor Israel. Ezra was born in Babylon. He was born in Babylon. I want you to think about that with me. Babylon. Babylon, that wicked city. Babylon, that, that cauldron of devils. Babylon, that, that, that terribly worldly city. He was... He was born in the middle of Babylon. Though he was born in the middle of Babylon, I'm so thankful that Babylon didn't get in the middle of Ezra. Though Ezra was born in the middle of an ungodly culture, that ungodly culture didn't get in to Ezra. I, we did it last week, and I'll do it again today. I just I feel like I want to... In this precarious, unique time that we're in in America right now, I want to encourage our young people. I want to encourage all of our children that regardless of what's going on in the world, you can still be focused on what's going on in the Word. 
The world is a mess right now, and I don't, I don't need, you don't need me to tell you that because you already know it, and I'm so sick and tired of even hearing about it. I just finally, about a month ago, I try to be up on current events, and I want to know what's happening in our country, and you know all that. And I used to listen to the news a lot, a lot. And about a month ago, I just made up my mind I'm unplugging from all of it because all I, all I heard every time I turned on the news was the same old lie or a different lie in deception, and I'm like, these people could not tell the truth standing on the Bible looking at Jesus. These people couldn't tell the truth to save their lives. And I know, I, this is not a political statement, but I believe it's nonetheless a true statement. It was coined by our president, fake news. There is a lot of fake news out there. There is a, a propaganda machine that's pumping out everything. And it's, I'm just saying, we're living in a world right now that's in a great big mess. I'm not here to curse America. I'm not here to talk about how bad America is. I thank God I live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. I thank God for that. But listen up, folks. We're not the America of old. There are devious forces that are at work right now in our country, right now, that would like a hostile takeover and what I mean by that, it's an ideological takeover. It is a philosophical takeover that's happening right now before our eyes. And what America needs is that America needs a revival. Um, oh, God. America needs churches that are strong. People that are strong. Saints that are strong. People that got a stiffened spine as to all of the resistance. We shouldn't be surprised. There is a devil, and his full-time job 24-7 is to try to stop the church of the living God. We don't whine about that. We don't cry about that. We are soldiers in the army of the Lord. Amen. Ezra is a young man. He's a young man. He's a young man, Leonard. And he's a young man that is growing up in Babylon. Everywhere that he looks around him is the world. Everywhere that he looks around him is sin and debauchery. Everybody just worshiping other gods, doing other stuff. But he was a young man that though he was born in Babylon, Babylon was not born into him. Though he lived in Babylon, Babylon didn't live in him. Though he was in the world, the world was not in uh, him. Introduce you to a young guy that had every excuse in all the world to just be a worldly moron. He could have just said, you know, this is all that I know. And yet when I picture, if I picture him in my mind, I see a studious young man. Oh, hallelujah. Give us studious young people. Come on. I see a young man that while all this cauldron of wickedness is around him, he's not looking up at the world and being enamored by the world. He's looking down into his heart, and he's looking down into the word of God. Instead of being captivated by the world, he is being captivated by the word. I'm not going to let the word get world get my attention. I'm going to let the word get my attention. And here's a young man that's born in Babylon, raised in Babylon, and yet Babylon's not in him. You say, why was Babylon not in him? Because the word of God was in him. And it's almost like he put his head down. He tucked his shoulders in, and he said, I'm going to focus on God, and I'm going to focus on the word of God, and the world can do what it wants to do, but I've got a God in my life and I've got the word of God in my life and I'm going to focus on the word of God. Our young people are being thrown into godless universities. Godless universities. That's right. They are. Godless universities. Public schools that have gone a complete different direction. And you have Imperial Babylon and all of its impressive, intimidating accomplishments. And yet Ezra, I'm going to say a word right now, and it's a word I feel passionate about, and it's a word that all of us as God's people need to be passionate about. Are you ready? Ezra was separated. That's right. So a lot of people nowadays say, oh, you don't need all that stuff. Oh, it doesn't matter. Say by grace, through faith. No, 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 no. 
Same like you're saved by grace. It doesn't mean you can live like a dirt bag and have the morals of a cockroach. Grace empowers us to live godly. Grace gives us power to do what's right. Grace tells us what's right. It teaches us what's wrong. Grace empowers us to do the right thing. Grace makes us godly. It doesn't make us worldly. Grace makes us more like Jesus and less like the world. And Ezra, Ezra was separated. And it was a beautiful word to him. Separated. Because, man, I'm living in Babylon. And Babylon wants to eat me for lunch. And Babylon wants to eat my commitment for lunch. But I'm not letting Babylon take my commitment to God. Come on, young people. I'm not letting Babylon shape my moral values. I'm not letting Babylon tell me how I'm going to live my life. Because Ezra said, I'm a young man, but I'm giving myself to the book. I'm giving myself to the book. I'm giving myself to the word. I'm giving myself to God's principles. And Ezra separates himself. The word of God. The word of God gets into his heart. And Ezra becomes the very first. He's the very first. He's the very first scribe in Israel. I know some of us, we read the New Testament, we're like, you know, sometimes they were looked down upon. Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes. And if they were looked down upon, it was because of their hypocrisy. Scribe was a good thing, and Ezra is, in the Bible, he is the first scribe in Israel. He initiates the high and lofty calling of the scribe. What's the scribe? A scribe is a professional class with a broad cl- field of interest. The scribe was the quintessential professional, competent, administrative, leadership, but most importantly, study and interpretation of the Word of God and of the prophets. In other words, Ezra, you know what Ezra gave himself to? Ezra gave himself to the word of God. They say that Ezra was the one that brought together the Old Testament canon of scripture. He brought it together. In other words, he brought together the compilation of the Old Testament scripture up until that point. He was the scribe. Ezra gave us the word of God. He gave us the word of God. I'm preaching today about revival And I want all of us to be reminded this morning that there is no revival without the Bible. That's good preaching. In fact, what I'm here to talk about this morning is that revival is going to be found in the Bible. If I want revival, I find revival in the Bible. Amen. And Ezra is just that man. He's a man that's given to the ministry of the Word of God. He has few equals. He is a slavish copy of no man. Matter of fact, it says of him, Ezra 7 and 10, it says that Ezra had prepared his heart for what? To seek the law of the Lord. He prepared his heart. Something inside of him said, I got to know this Bible. I hope we all feel that way today. Oh, God. Help me to prepare my heart. Help me to be a person of the Word of God. I thank God for the Spirit. This is a Spirit-filled church. Amen? We believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. We believe in miracle signs and wonders. We believe in the power of the Spirit. But you know that dove that is a metaphor for the Spirit? That dove has two wings. You know what? If if a dove only has one wing, what's going to happen? Dove has two wings. You know, you meet some people, they're all spirit. They're all spirit. It's all prayer. It's all spirit. We believe in spirit. Got to have prayer. Got to have a move of the spirit. Got to have a move of God. But sometimes if all you got is spirit, you can get weird. Uh It's true. Spirit, spirit, spirit. We have to have spirit. There's no question about it. It's a Pentecostal church. We have to have spirit. You know what balances spirit? Word of God. Word of God. Now, some people are all, they're, they're, they're biased toward c- complete word. You know what? If you get word and spirit operating in tandem together, you know what you're going to have? You're going to have flight. You're going to have balance. There's a balance. We're a Pentecostal church. We believe in the power of the spirit. But I tell you what, we equally believe in the power of the word of God. 
the power of the word of God. And Ezra is involved in a mighty revival. He set his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to do it too. Some people are far educated beyond their, their level of obedience. It's good to know the Bible. It's really good to obey the Bible. As a matter of fact, if I know a bunch of stuff that I don't do, woe unto me. We need obedience to God's word. In other words, when I begin to seek the law like he did, I dedicate myself to the word of God. All of a sudden, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be going into the word either. It may be at church. I may hear a word. I'm like, and you may be like, well, I've never heard that before. You may be reading something in the scripture like, man, what, what in the world does that mean? And sometimes you get really excited about it, and sometimes you want to cry about it. Because sometimes this word of God, you know what it does? It points out areas of our life where God wants to improve us. And you know what I can do? I can say, well, God, I don't see it that way. You know what God does? He just says, okay, you don't see it that way. I'll change my word to fit you. That's a fair, that's a fair request. I'll change my word to, to fit you. Guess what? God doesn't change his word to fit me. I change myself to fit his word. I'm not looking for a church that fits me. I'm looking to fit into the church, fit into the word. What is God's word? What is God's will for my life? And even sometimes if it means it steps on my toes a little bit, sometimes I get excited, jump to my feet, say, amen. Other times I shrink back a little bit and I say, oh, me. But either way, I want the word of God in my life. I want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, because you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth shall make you free. It's the word of God. Oh, hallelujah. We got people from coming from all kinds of backgrounds. Man, we got former addicts. We got dealers. We got all people been in and out of prison. But let me tell you what. It doesn't matter what you used to be. Because if you get the word of God inside of your heart, and you get the spirit of God inside of your heart, and you begin to follow the word of God, all of a sudden, you're going to wake up one day and say, who was that guy that I was a year ago? What was I even thinking? Because the word of God has the power to transform and to change my life. When I say, I want to follow the word of God. Even when it hurts. Even when it hurts. And then the Bible says, Ezra 7 and 10, it says, He sought the Lord that he might do it and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Because you don't start teaching until you've learned and been obedient. That's a dangerous style of preacher that doesn't know the word and is disobedient to the word and then wants to teach and preach the word. That's just free. You can just think about that all day long if you like. It's teach. Oh, I want to be a preacher. I want to be a preacher. No, you don't want to be a preacher. You don't want to be a preacher until you have sought this book and brought yourself into alignment with this book. And then Ezra says, then you teach the word of God. Amen i got three points I'm going to give you very quickly. So here we got, we got Ezra, gifted administrator, but his primary gifting was a heart of passion for the word of God. Point number one, when God wants to reestablish his people, there will always be teachers and preachers at the forefront. Why? Because the word of God must be central. We can't have a revival without the Word of God. But we can have a revival with the Word of God. Oh, yes, we can. That's what Ezra would tell us. Ezra is a part of a massive reform movement, rebuilding what had been destroyed. It had been destroyed, like the church going through the dark ages. It had been destroyed. They're rebuilding the wall. They're rebuilding the temple. They're rebuilding worship in the hearts of God's people toward God. They're rebuilding a foundation of the word of God. Ezra called the people back to a renewed spiritual life. How did he do that? He did that through the word of God. He did that that through let's get back to the book amen
He brought those restored exiles back to God's word. Nehemiah comes eight years later and rebuilds a physical wall. But eight years before, Ezra the scribe is rebuilding spiritual walls. Because there's no sense in having physical walls if you don't have spiritual walls. And those spiritual walls are a result of the word of God. God and Ezra said let's bring the book uh, let's make the book central let's make the book the middle of all that we are and all that we do uh, let's get back to the word of God because if we're going to have a revival where are we going to find a revival are we going to go to the north uh, are we going to go to the south is it in the east uh, is it in the west uh, where are we going to find a revival is it in the white house uh, is it in the state house where are we going to find a revival is it in the university is it in the military where are we going to revive find a revival. I'll tell you where we're going to find a revival. In the Word of God. Revival is in the Bible. That was his primary mission as a scribe in the law of God. Bringing everyone back to the Word of God. It's got to be central. Middle of all that we do. Look at, look at Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 4. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood. (laughs) And now what it said, he stood upon, right? He stood upon the pulpit. He stood upon the pulpit of wood. That's scaring me. Scares me. He stood upon the pulpit. Ezra brought us the pulpit. Paul, Ezra brought us the pulpit. But it's not the pulpit like we think about the pulpit. We thank God for the pulpit. The pulpit, there's a reason why. I mean, you can have you can have different styles. You can have metal pulpits, wood pulpits, you can have, I don't know, fiberglass pulpits, you can have see-through pulpits. Some people don't like see-through pulpits. I'm not gonna tell you why. I probably should tell you why. I I am a preacher that will freely confess that I have preached with my zipper down, and it is not cool. It is not cool. You have a see-through pulpit, you cannot zip, zip your zipper publicly. So that's all done and taken care of. There's all kinds of pulpits, right? All kinds of pulpits, different locations. You ever been into a Lutheran church and there's one way up over here and there's one way up here? This church has a pulpit, and you know where the pulpit is? The pulpit's in the middle of the church. It's front and center. That's not by accident. That's by design. The pulpit is in the middle of the church. You know why? Because this is the focus. The focus must be the word of God. The church is centrifugal, and it's built around the word of God. It's built around the word of God. It's the word. The preaching of the word of God. The Bible says Ezra stood upon the pulpit of water. What does that mean then? So what's, what do you, this is a different kind of a pulpit. You know what the pulpit that he's talking about is? The pulpit is an elevated platform. That's what it was. So we have a platform here, right? Platform. You know why there's a platform? This is powerful. It's about 21 and a half inches. It's an elevated place. Ezra said, Ezra brought us the platform. He platformed the word of God. Why did Ezra platform the word of God? Because what he was saying was, the word of God needs to be above everything else. The word of God needs to be visible. It needs to be able to be seen and heard. Thank God for the platform. Thank God for the platform. I'll tell you, my philosophy about the platform is you better protect your platform. Because whatever you platform, you're going to propagate like seed into future generations. I'm not saying this is just for a certain whatever type of people. But what happens on this platform ought to matter. It ought to be exemplary. It ought to be right. Most importantly, it ought to be biblical. We want to be biblical. We're going to elevate. There's got to be an elevated place. Why? For all the people to look up and say, thank God for the word of God. Thank God for the word of God. Thank God for the pulpit. We need the pulpit. We need the word of God. You know how the church stays out of the dark ages, of the darkest of nights? The church went through a dark ages. And you know how it went through a dark ages? When false doctrine and deception and foolish men and foolish women play with the word of God. 
I don't want to change this Bible. I don't want to be Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was an incredible leader. He was, a, he was incredibly skilled. He gave, us, he gave us so many powerful documents in America, and we thank God for that. But do you know he was a deist, which meant there were things in this Bible that Thomas Jefferson, wise as he was, he didn't like. And when he didn't like them, you know what he did? He just took a pair of scissors and went through the Bible, and he cut out the verses that he didn't like. It's called the Jefferson Bible. You say, that's crazy. I know people that do the very same thing. They may not, they may not take scissors out. They say, oh, don't mean that. Don't mean that. Oh, that's not for us today. That's not for this. I don't, I, I don't want to take out of the Bible what doesn't fit me. I want to adjust my life into alignment with the Word of God. Because if I can get in alignment with the Word of God, I can get the favor of God upon my life because he's exalted his Word above his name. And there's something about the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Something happens in my life when the Word of God comes into my life. It has the power to change me. And that's why Ezra built a pulpit of wood. Elevating the word of God. Nehemiah 8 and 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. He opened the book. Here's the word of God. When he opened it, all the people stood up. Like I said, good tradition. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, amen, amen, lifting up their hands. They bowed their heads. They read the book of the law of God. You know what that meant? The people were saying amen, amen, saying we're going to bring ourselves into alignment with the word of God. We're going to bring ourselves into alignment with the word of God. Oh, I wish I had time to talk about this book all day long. But the B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. The B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. And here comes this kid raised in Babylon, reared in Babylon, rising up through the ranks. He gives himself to the word of God. Isn't it amazing that the favor of God comes upon those that dedicate themselves to the work of God. And all of a sudden, here's this little nobody guy. He's a scribe in the law of the Lord. He's some little Jewish guy that given himself. He, he, he wasn't trying to impress Babylon, but all of a sudden, his obedience to God brought the favor of King Artaxerxes upon him. And King Artaxerxes, here is this worldly leader that says, here's a kid that's given himself to the word of God. And the mighty king of Babylon outfits Ezra with a decree to return to Jerusalem. He is given official verification. He is given validation to return to Israel and to Jerusalem. Not only that, he gives him silver and gold and he finances the excursion and encourages him, Ezra, whatever you need to buy, whatever you need, whatever material you need for burnt offerings, whatever you need for meal offerings, he more or less gave Ezra a blank check and said, whatever you got to do to have a restoration and a revival, I'm going to give it to you. I'm telling you what I am believing God that if we'll remain dedicated to this book, we will lack no resources. We will lack none of what we need to do what God wants us to do. If we will give ourselves to this book, we don't have to be on our knees before the government asking the government to give us what we need. If we're on our knees before God, then God can bring kings to us. I feel prophecy here this morning, and he can bring resources to us, and he can bring us what we need to do what he wants done when we give ourselves to the the book. God says, I'll give you whatever resources you need. He restores the vessels of worship that Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple. It was an amazing act of God's kindness. He said, it's time for revival in Israel. He brings together a team. Teamwork makes the dream work. He brings a Haggai, a Zerubbabel, a, a Zechariah. He brings together all these different players, men of different gifts, different callings, that have the same integrity and passion and giftings and heart for God. I tell you what, we need every Sunday school teacher. We need every life group leader. We need every, all of our evangelism people. We need all the saints of God. We need all the singers. Come on. We need all the prayer warriors. We need all the intercessors. We need all the soul winners. We need all the lovers of the word. We need everybody working together. Come on. It's a huge undertaking. If there's going to be a restoration of the work of God like Ezra had, it took everybody, everybody. It took administrators. It took, it, it took builders. It took, it took architects. It took, it took all of the different giftings together. But don't ever forget, in the middle of all of it, Ezra is bringing the people back 
to the Word of God. Hardcore to the Word of God. Brother Lund, can you help me out? Ezra chapter number 9. Point number 2. When you dedicate yourself to the Word of God, I'll tell you what happens. Our hearts become sensitive to God. They become sensitive to sin. And they become sensitive to compromise. Amen. When we give ourselves to the Word of God, something begins to move within us. God begins to move within us. And all of a sudden, we start looking at things differently. Our assessments are different. The way we look at the world, the way that we look at our interactions, the way we look at our, our lives, all of a sudden begins to change when we look into the Word. And Ezra is a man of the Word, and all of a sudden he's in the Word, and he starts looking around, and he says, uh-oh, we're in trouble. Read. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed hath mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle, and plucked off the, the hair of my head and of my beard, and sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose up with my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this Holy day. And for our iniquities Jesus have we, us. our kings and our priests, been delivered un into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. 12 through 14. Now therefore, give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever. For ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou our God hath, hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve and hast given us such deliverance as this, should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldest not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? Chapter 10 and 1. Now when, Ezra, now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed weeping and, and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. Ezra, man of the word of God, all of a sudden he looks and the people, if you allow me to say it this way, God's people are dating outside of the church. They're intermingling with the people of the land. Not only are they doing that, they're, they're marrying people that are outside of the community of faith. And he's looking at this, this man of the word, and he's like, Artaxerxes has given me favor. Here we are with silver and gold. We're rebuilding a temple. We're rebuilding worship. God's given us a revival. We have a space of grace. There's a little reviving taking place. And I look around, and all of a sudden, there's compromise taking place in the camp. He says, my God, what are we going to do? He didn't, he didn't rail the people. He went to the house of God. He fell upon his knees, and the Bible said he, he wept. And it wasn't a, a, a little alligator tears. It wasn't two minutes, five minutes. All day, he's weeping at the tabernacle in and, and literally, the Bible says he is pulling his hair out. He ripped his clothes. Uh, why? Because the people were intermingling with the land. And it disturbed his heart because he knew uh, that what they were doing was wrong before God. And he's weeping and he's confessing. And he's saying, oh God, help us. Uh, we can't do this again. This is what brought us into captivity in the first place. We ended up in Babylon for this. Uh, we can't go back to the world. Uh, we can't go back to living like that. And he's, he's upset and he's he's praying and he's interceding and he's crying out to God. He's literally tearing his heart out. His hair out. He's disturbed. What are you saying, Pastor? Point number two. I'm going to say a word here. I think it needs to re-enter. May, oh God, in the middle of this 21st century American culture, may it get back deep within our hearts. Here's the word. Are you ready? Conviction. Conviction. 
Conviction. Conviction. Because Ezra knew one of the things that messed up God's people was compromised. They weren't separated anymore. Their culture was infiltrating their thinking, their morality, and their lives, and their relationships, and marriages that were happening. It was infiltrating, and all of a sudden this compromise and something happened in Ezra. Ezra, that conviction that was within him, he tore his clothes. Oh, sweet conviction. Oh, sweet conviction. Where are you? Conviction, sweet conviction. Come on, we won't fight you, conviction. So many nowadays want to shut their ears to the voice of conviction. Don't tell me that. I don't want to hear that. I don't need that. That doesn't apply to me. Oh, my goodness. I'll tell you what we want to do. We want to take the posture of a man of the Word of God. We want the posture of a man that's in the Word that says, God, if your Word says that, then we repent, oh, God. I'm not asking you to change, Lord. I'm willing to change. Oh, sweet conviction. We thank you for your touch, sweet conviction. We'll alter our lives so that we can please God and have the blessing of God upon us our lives. We will change. We will do what we have to do. We will repent. We will walk away from it. We will put it down. Oh, sweet conviction. Oh, sweet conviction. Oh, sweet conviction. It says he ripped his clothes. He pulled out his hair and his beard. New Living Translation said he was utterly shocked. Amplified says he was appalled. Other translations say he was disgusted. It was revulsion. Why? 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 Because when you get in the Word, God gets in your heart. And when God gets in your heart, you can't blow off sin like you used to blow off sin. Ah. When you get the Word in your heart, and some things got to go. Some changes just have to be made. When you focus on the Word of God, like Ezra did, he had spent decades of his life in the Word of God until his spirit was sharpened to a sharp edge. And he knew that's wrong. We can't do that. We need a revival. We need God to continue to bless us. And he's not going to bless foolishness and folly, compromise and sin. And so Ezra brought them back to the Word of God. Brought them back to the word of God. Because this book will make us sensitive to sin and compromise. Would you lift your hands to the Lord right now? Talk to him. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, God. Help us to be sensitive, Lord. Help us to be sensitive, O oh God. Put within us, Jesus, a fine-tuned edge, Lord, that comes from relationship and the Word and prayer and bringing ourselves into compliance over and over. May conviction be strong in the church. A hatred for compromise, a desire to please you and you alone, Lord, in all we do. Oh God, we need a revival, Jesus. We need a revival. We need a revival. We need a revival, Lamb of God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's thank the Lord together. Jesus' name, Jesus' name, Jesus' name. Jesus' name, Jesus' name, Jesus' name. name. Help us, O God. I'm closing. My final point. Third thing. There's an amazing phrase that you're going to find all throughout the book of Ezra. It's Ezra's coined phrase. He uses it over and over and over again. There's a phrase he uses over and over. This man of the word of God. The phrase is the hand of our God. Watch. Ezra 7 and 6. This Ezra went up from Babylon. He was already scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given, and the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of our of the Lord his God upon him. Ezra 7 and 9, for under the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. On the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. Ezra 7, 28, I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. 
Ezra 8 and 18. And by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought unto us a man of understanding. Ezra 8 and 22. I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers. I'm not going to the world to get my help because we had said God was with us, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. Ezra 8 and 31. Then we departed from the river of Ahava on the 12th day of the first month to go unto Jerusalem, and the hand of our God was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of of the enemy and of such as lay in wait in the way. The hand of God and the hand of God was upon us. Oh, I feel, I feel God so strong right now. I don't know if you're feeling what I'm feeling. I feel God so strong right now. The hand of our God was upon us. The hand of God was upon us. The hand of the Lord helped us. The hand of the Lord was there because you know why? If you've got a relationship with the word of God, then you'll have a connection with the hand of God. If the law of God is central, then the hand of God is going to be there. That's the kind of revival I'm talking about to us, River of Life Church, here on a Sunday morning, a 4th of July weekend. That's the kind of revival I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of revival when the word is elevated. And this is what matters to me in my life is to live this word of God. And church, listen up. Our greatest days will be ahead of us if, if we make the word of God the most central thing in our lives. The hand of God will be upon us. The hand of God is upon us. And if the hand of God is upon us, there's nothing that he won't help us to do. And if the hand of God is not upon us, all of our labor and all of our work will be fruitless it of no avail. But if the hand of God is upon us, there's nothing we can't do through him. Come on, River of Life. How many want that kind of revival? Come on, let's stand together. How many want that kind of revival?